Um, okay, thanks a lot. Um, so yes, this talk is about common knowledge and coordination. Um, um, so there is this notion of um, public information, that some information is public. Um, it's a very intuitive notion, right? So in, in our group of people right now, we can presumably assume that the uh, information about which city is the capital of France is public. We all share it. Um, the, the notion of public information has um, lots of applications, but most prominently for, in linguistics. Uh, we all, presumably we all, we all heard about Stolnaker's theory. If information is public, we can safely presuppose it. Um, and uh, public information is also exploited in a number of cases to solve puzzles that have to do with coordination in group of agents. Um, I, we, I, I will talk about this uh, more specifically soon. Um, the standard way to understand public information, public information can be declined into public knowledge or public belief. The standard way of understanding these notions is as common knowledge or common belief. Uh, something is common knowledge in a group if everybody knows it and everybody knows that everybody knows it and everybody knows that everybody knows it and so on forever. Similarly for public belief. Um, now, we have this informal notion of public information and then we have this con concept of uh, common knowledge. I, I, the, the, the discussion will be in terms of common knowledge, although uh, everything I say applies also to public belief, to common belief. So we have this informal notion of public information. It's intuitive, it's useful. And we have this um, more precise notion of common knowledge. Um, usually these are identified, um, but uh, there's this recent paper by Liederman um, which resists the identification. And this talk is um, motivated by trying to respond to Lederman. In a sense, uh, you should be, you know, there's something, there's something fishy about common knowledge. Because if something is common knowledge, in a way, uh, if it is common knowledge that Paris is the capital of France, then we all know that Paris is the capital of France, but we also all know that we all know it. So common knowledge sort of entitles me to, to, to peek into your mind, to know what you know. It's not obvious that that, how, how that works. Common knowledge in the words of uh, Harvey Lederman demands that people be able to access each, each other's, mind, other's minds as if they were their own. You're supposed to think that that's, um, that's odd, right? That's, that's not, it, it's not obvious how this should happen. Now, I want to start by comparing two pictures. Um, one we call the infinite hall of mirrors, and it's a picture that Lederman criticizes. Uh, the description goes like this. The proponents of common knowledge and its relatives suppose that when two people meet, their beliefs create a hall of mirrors. Each person's beliefs reflect the world, but also the other's beliefs, which in turn reflect the first person's beliefs and so on in an infinite sequence of reflections of reflections. And uh, this infinite mirrors stuff is, is qu quite bizarre if you think about it, right? So just because you and I meet on the sidewalk, we both see a dog and then all of a sudden there is this, there is this, this, this infinite sequence of, of knowledge operators about what I know that you know, that I know that you know, um, it's some, it's um, it, you know it, it's unclear what grounds all of this um, um, all of this abundance of uh, iteration iterations of the knowledge operators. On the other hand, you can compare this with what we might call the black box view, where there is no common knowledge, um, on which you know we're sort of like locked into our own minds. When two people meet, their mind remains lock into a dark box from which they cannot, they cannot escape. So there's no way for me to access your mind. This is the topic of the talk. And I think this stuff is super interesting and there are connections with the work that I've been doing with Luca. Um, it has to do with communication. We'll get to that at the end. Um, uh, so the, um, the, the, the point for the, at least for the, for the most of this, for most of this talk is to respond to uh, this recent paper by Harvey Liederman, in which he argues that public information cannot be identified with common knowledge, even for ideally rational agents. 
and I think this is a very, a very fun, a very fun paper to read if you have time. So. Uh, I will give a qualified reply. Uh, at the end of which, there are three points that I care about. The first is that common knowledge can be established on the basis of communication and deduction um, for ideally rational agents, at least, uh, at least given some previous common knowledge. Uh, that I will be agnostic on whether common knowledge may or may, may obtains empirically, um, but common knowledge is at least something we can keep in our theoretical toolkit for the sake of generality, for because we care about gen, general theories of rationality, general theories of linguistics, and so forth. And the third point is that uh, in applications, um, coordination, which is perhaps the most prominent uh, result we like to obtain on the basis of common knowledge, may also obtain without it. So that um, the way coordination happens in practice, it may happen because we have a ground of shared public information um, on which we base our actions and then we coordinate. Uh, but there's also kind of coordination that happens independently of common knowledge. Okay, so I start with uh, discussing Liederman's paper on, on common knowledge and I start with the gen giving, giving you the general idea. The general idea is that ignorance about other people's minds can undermine common knowledge. And this can happen also for ideally rational people. Um, so uh, the argument um, builds on uh, the following scenario. There's actually a lot of frills in this description, which we don't care about, but I give you the, the, the scenario the way Liederman uh, uh, presents it in the paper. So the scenario is this, Roman and Columba are two ideal reasoners playing in a game show. Each contestant has a single button on a console in front of him or her. They have an unobstructed view of each other's faces and of an area in the middle of the stage where the host will place a sailboat. First, the host will bring out a toy, a toy sailboat, the test, with a hundred centimeters mast. They will then replace it with a sailboat chosen randomly for an array of sailboats of various sizes. If the mast of the new sailboat is taller than the test and both players press their respective buttons, they receive $1,000 each. If the mast is not taller than the test and both press, or if only one person presses their button, the person or people who pressed must pay the show $100. Today, the mast of, chosen, the, the, mast of the chosen boat is 300 centimeters tall. So just uh, so that we're on the same page, this is essentially a coordination game. There's these two players that have to press the button simultaneously, just in case some condition obtains. The condition is that the object they see is taller than a test that they were given. That what they're seeing is a, is a boat that is three meters tall. The test was one meter. They win the game if they both press. So essentially they win the game if they, if they coordinate action. Uh, otherwise, um, um, they lose. Um, now, some further uh, um, details about the case. The two characters, we may assume that they uh, have perfect knowledge of their own mind, so they, there's perfect introspection. These, after all, are ideal reasoners, right? So they all know, each knows what, so Roman knows what Roman knows, and Columba knows what Columba knows. Um, but don't, they don't necessarily know what the other knows. and this is crucial as we shall see and it's also in a way fairly intuitive right so in a situation like this where you and i are both seeing the same object uh maybe i don't even have perfect knowledge about my own mind but certainly i don't know what you what's going on in yours um now Liederman claims for the argument um, as the conclusion of the argument I'm about to give you, that in this scenario, uh, these two ideal reasoners don't have common knowledge that the boat is taller than one meter. So let's see what, how the argument goes. It's in two parts. Um, first, we assume this principle, ideal common knowledge. Necessarily, if some agents have public information that they are ideal reasoners, then if they have public information that P, it is common knowledge among them that P. Um, here, here Essentially, what this is saying is that if some agents have public information about something, then they have common knowledge of it. Um, 
And if you, of course, if you thought that the notion of public information is analyzed as common knowledge, uh, then you also buy into this strong, the biconditional, which is which is actually stronger, right? But you certainly subscribe to this. Um, now, two uh, further premises that follow from the game from the descriptions: it is public information that, well, maybe this is not exactly in the description. But these two are the two characters are ideal reasoners. We also assume that it is public information that it, that they are ideal reasoners perhaps because the game show host uh, told them so, and it's credible, and he's credible. And it is public information that the mass looks three meter tall to both. Um, so from this, it follows, uh, it's a very simple application of ideal CK to one and two, that it is common knowledge among them that the mass looks taller than a meter. Second part of the argument, we make this, second, this further assumption, interpersonal ignorance. It is common knowledge, common knowledge among our two uh, players that if the mass looks r meters tall to one player, then for all that player knows, the mass looks r minus epsilon meters tall to the other player. And intuitively, what this is saying is that, so imagine that you and I are looking at something that is uh, three meters tall. Then for all I know, it's slightly less than three meters for you. And it looks three meters tall to me, but for all I know, it could be slightly shorter to you. And that's because I am, I am ignorant about your mind. I don't know exactly what goes on in your mind. There might be uh, errors in perception, miscalculations of all sorts. Maybe you are uh, slightly tipsy or whatever. Um, this premise seems also somewhat plausible. Um, now, from this premise, it follows, and from this premise and, and, uh, some, and the game and the description of the scenario, it follows that for all Roman knows, uh, the mast looks three minus epsilon meters to Columbus. So the mast is three meters tall. It looks three meters tall to Roman. Epsilon is a vanishingly small quantity. So by interpersonal ignorance, for all Roman knows, the mast looks three minus epsilon meters to Columba. Uh, now, uh, with from this conclusion, uh, intermediate conclusion, it, it also follow, it follows that for all Roman knows, for all Columba knows, the mast looks three minus two epsilon meters to Roman. And then you can continue, right? So for all Roman knows, for all Columba knows, for all Roman knows, the mast looks three minus three epsilon meters to Columba and so forth. Uh, this is an induction. Um, at the end of which we show that and we conclude that for all each player knows, for all each player knows, blah, 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 the mass looks to be less than a meter to the other player. Um, putting these two parts of the argument together, it follows that it is common knowledge that the mass looks taller than a meter and that it is not common knowledge that the mass looks taller than a meter. And so um, we conclude that ideal common knowledge is false. It entails a contradiction. That's the argument. Now, you can uh, you can try to find a way out of the argument by denying this this claim here of interpersonal ignorance. Uh, there's um, um, someone in the in in the literature that has, has tried doing that, but um, for the purposes of this paper, I um, uh, person uh, Emerman, that's his name. Uh, for the purposes of this paper, I'll uh, let's just just assume that that this is fine, right? That, that it's correct to assume that in some cases. Um, you can have this situation where you, 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 you accommodate, even for ideal reasoners, we, are, we accommodate for the fact that the other person might uh, not look at something in, the, in precisely the same way um, uh, that, that you are looking at it. I didn't say this very clearly, but I think you get the gist. Okay. And so, um, Right, and so um, it, it, the conclusion would seem to be, you, you know, you cannot look into another person's mind as if it's your own. Now, um, I should also say that the argument is is fairly general; it doesn't really depend on features of the example, and that uh, Lederman himself 
um, generalizes it to a number of other cases where, uh, so for example, another application would be that um, you and I do not have common knowledge that I am not a rock or things like this. So um, failing in paradigmatically simple cases, Liederman suggests that people cannot have common knowledge of anything. Uh, now, this seems to be a pretty devastating conclusion if you think about all the nice applications that common knowledge has in linguistics where it accounts for how we coordinate on the interpretation of sentences or in, um, in, uh, in game theory, where it accounts for how a rational agents can find equilibria and so forth. Um, but I want to say we do have common knowledge in at least some cases. And the standard example in which common knowledge um, uh, can be well, at least one standard example in which we see the common knowledge can be established in the literature is the story of the Madi children, which you might have heard about before. Um, and that I want to, so um, I'm not gonna say anything um, anything new, any new result about the Madi children. Dialectically, I'm using the Madi children story against the um, uh, Lederman case, and I will show that there's a version of it um, with the same assumption as in the start of Mandy Children, in which the character in Letterman's story also can obtain common knowledge. So the standard story is this. Uh, there's the three children, Ava, Bert, and Chang, who we, they're slightly ideal, so they always speak the truth and they have uh, perfect reasoning powers. Um, they've been playing outside for a while, and uh, let's just assume that Ava and Bert have mud on their foreheads while Chang is clean. Each child can see whether other, are, uh, whether other ch children are dirty, but cannot see their own forehead. At some point, their father calls them back inside and says, at least one of you is dirty. Um, which is something um, each of them knew because each of them could see at least one dirty child. But now their father said it. Um, and they all conf at, at this point, they all confess their ignorance about who is dirty. They, none of them knows who, which children are dirty and which are not, because none of them can see their own forehead. None of them can see themselves. But as soon as everybody said that they don't know who's dirty, it follows that they have common knowledge about who's dirty. How? Um, uh, and well, and the, uh, I'll tell you how, how in a second, uh, the, the moral of this story will be that if enough is public, among the children, if enough information is public among the children, they may consistently derive uh, an item of common knowledge. And this shows that ideal common knowledge and interpersonal ignorance are not necessarily incompatible because we may, we may assume that both this assumption, inter, ideal common knowledge and interpersonal ignorance hold of them at the children. So first of all, how do the children find out, how do the children uh, acquire common knowledge about who's dirty? Right, so here's a schematic representation of their epistemic state, of their collective epistemic state. You have um, for eight possible words, each is represented by uh, three uh, parameters here. Um, in this, this, this circled one up here is the actual word. It, it tells you that Ava is muddy, Bert is muddy, and Chang is not muddy. And then you have all of the other words. Words that are epistemically indistinguishable uh, for a player, are, for a child, are connected. So for example, because, um, so Ava is in, is in blue. So if you look at these two corners up here, I, I imagine you can see my cursor. Um, Bert cannot, so Ava is in blue, so Ava cannot see the, herself. So for her, this word in which all three are muddy, and this word in which Ava is clean, but the other two are muddy, are epistemically indistinguishable. Because the only thing that distinguishes her, th these two words, is the status of Ava, and Ava doesn't know her status. So this is the, the epistemic state of the children, collective epistemic state of the children at the beginning of the, in, of, the, of the story. Then if you go to figure two, you see what happens after the father told them, at least one of you is dirty. Um, and what happens is that the word in which they are all clean, which is this uh, bottom corner here, disappears, and with the, its connections. Uh, but 
it's still the case that uh, there are epistemic possibilities that each of them cannot distinguish. So they all have to say that they don't know who's dirty. Um, but from that, it follows that no child can only see, that no child can see only uh, clean children. Um, and because if a child was able to see only clean children and the father just told them that at least one of them is dirty, then that child would know that they are the dirty one, right? So then the child, as soon as they, all, they have all said, um, uh, we don't know who's dirty, they can conclude, um, uh, they, 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 they have common knowledge about uh, which word is the actual word because they can exclude words um, in which um, uh, uh, two children are clean, which is the uh, nodes that disappear in the last diagram. Okay, so this is the standard story of the mad children. Um, we can, so what happens is by receiving some public information from the father, at least one of you is dirty, and by reasoning about it and about the answers, or at least the, about the statement of ignorance that they all make, they can establish a piece of common knowledge. Uh, further details, um, as I mentioned, we assume that these are sincere ideal reasoners. We also assume that they can communicate. Um, we assume ideal common knowledge. So if something is public among the children, uh, it is common knowledge among them. So as soon as the father gives, makes this public announcement, one of you is dirty, that becomes common knowledge, which in the sequence of diagrams just means that that node in which all children are clean uh, gets eliminated. Um, and a version of interpersonal ignorance is compatible with the Madi children. Uh, in particular, if a child thinks that, uh, if, a, if a child thinks that they're Madi, then for all that child knows, another child thinks that they're clean. In other words, uh, um, yeah, so for all, for all I know, you may think that I am, if I'm one of the Madi children, for all I know, you may think that I'm Madi, or you might think that I'm not Madi. Uh, so I'm ignorant about your mind. And yet common knowledge can be established um, by logic, essentially, by reasoning about uh, what is common knowledge and um, on, the, on, on the basis of public information. Uh, in the story, the role of communication is crucial. And in fact, it's something that's conspicuously absent from the sailboat scenario that Liederman discusses, because communication is used to make more and more information public as soon as much as it's necessary to establish common knowledge in the limit. Now, um, the same holds of a modified version of um, the sailboat scenario. In, in this variant, I'm skipping the, the details that don't matter. Uh, you have Roman and Colomba, two idea reasoners. They have an unobstructed view of their environment. There is a three meters tall sailboat in front of them, which looks to be three meters tall to each of them. So they don't, they're, on, they're not under any misperception. Um, two possibilities, at, at least two possibilities are salient to each of them, that the boat looks, so the boat looks three meters tall to each of them. The two possibilities are that the boat looks three meters tall also to the other person, or that it looks slightly less tall. So they have to sort out um, um, an epistemic state um, uh, that, that contains four, possible, four possibilities. In this scenario, ideal common knowledge and, and, and interpersonal ignorance both hold, at least at the beginning, because each is ignorant about what the other uh, person knows. And now we assume that there, a public announcement is made um, so that it is, it becomes common knowledge that um, the boat looks three meters tall to at least one of them. We're just exactly in the fol following the exactly the same pattern as the Madi children. So then um, the uh, characters here, Roman and Colombo ask themselves, do we commonly know how tall the mast looks to be? And first they have to say no, because I know that the mast, I'm, uh, Roman thinks I know that the mast looks three meters tall to me, but for all I know, the mass looks three meter, slightly less than three meters to Colomba. So both say they don't commonly know uh, the height of the mast. But once they both said no, they can conclude that they do have common knowledge. Why? Because um, if 
um, one of them, the mass didn't look uh, three meters tall to one of them. Once the uh, public announcement was made saying that the mass looks three meters tall to at least someone, that person would could have concluded that they don't have common knowledge. But since nobody uh, inferred that conclusion, um, the mass looks to be three meters tall to both. It's the same, exactly the same as the magician. In fact, it's slightly simpler because there's only two characters. Um, okay, so if the mass did not look three meters tall to a player, the player would have known that it looked three meters tall to the other uh, because of that public announcement that the mass looks three meters to at least someone. Um, hence, Yeah, so there's a few typos here. Um, hence, that player could have uh, concluded they did not that they did not do not commonly know the height of the mast. But since um, um, neither, but, for, but since they both said no to the question, do you com do we commonly know how tall the mast is looks to be? Then the mast looks to be three meters too off. Sorry about the typo. Um, um, so this shows that uh, essentially the same reasoning as the Maddie children stops Lederman's inductive case for the claim for the second for the second bit of uh, his original argument, which was meant to conclude that it is not common knowledge that the mass looks three meters tall. Okay, so in um, this uh, version of the sailboat scenario, communication is essential. Um, without communication, if we imagine for some reason that uh, the two characters cannot speak to each other, then we are in a case that is entirely analogous to other short stories that might be familiar in which common knowledge does fail. Uh, the two generals trying to coordinate an attack across enemy territory or the electronic mail game. But communication in general is available for rational ideal agents and for also people like us. Um, its job in this story is to issue public announcements, which by ideal common knowledge turn information into common knowledge. Now, if you think a moment about the dialectic, uh, Lederman has this argument against the notion of common knowledge. And now I'm saying, oh, but if you can just assume that communication can make more things public, then common knowledge is safe. Isn't that question begging? Uh, no, and but here's here's here how how it plays out. Um, Lederman's challenge is essentially a reductio argument, in which he says if a group of people um, has common knowledge that p, it follows by his argument that they don't have common knowledge that p. So he says we reject common knowledge. But no, now with the Maddy children, I'm saying, but if you also have common knowledge that p prime. So common knowledge about something else. In this particular case, that the mass looks to be three meters tall to at least one of the players. And you have this common knowledge uh, by virtue of a public announcement to that to, uh, 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 to support it. Then it is consistent for the group to have common knowledge at P. Um, so now Lederman could say, but then uh, suppose that you have common knowledge about this P prime and interpersonal, interpersonal ignorance. So perhaps the public announcement that the boat looks three meters tall to at least one of you was misheard or misinterpreted. So how do I know that you uh, uh, interpreted a certain utterance in the same way as I interpreted it? Um, well, then by Lederman's original argument, it follows that they don't have common knowledge about this P prime. And now we can have a Muddy Children come back. So we can imagine a previous public announcement uh, that made it the case that the same group has common knowledge about P double prime. So in other words, there is a previous public announcement that the next public announcement will be correctly interpreted by all the participants in the game uh, with such and such phonology and semantics. Uh, but not by, by all, but by at least someone. From which then, by the Maddy Children argument, common knowledge that P prime follows. So um, maybe I went a little fast, so I'm going to uh, slow down for question. But the result is uh, essentially a standoff. So um, you have a reductio argument 
from Lederman, which he says, assume that P is common knowledge, then it follows that it isn't, to which I reply, but if it was also common knowledge that P prime, uh, it is consistent to a common knowledge of P, to which he could say, but if by the same argument, if you assume that you have common knowledge of P prime, I get a reductio, and then I can assume that there's common knowledge of a previous P double prime and so forth. So uh, the challenge arises in every specific, in each, in each case, but in each specific case, it can be overcome uh, by making more information public. It's a sort of a skeptical fugue. Uh, are there questions? Okay. Uh, now, so the situation is, um, I'm calling it a, a skeptical fugue, because it's sort of analogous to uh, certain kind of skeptical arguments. So you have, a, in effect, Lederman is a skeptical argument against common knowledge, um, to which I'm replying, but if you have this supportive knowledge, uh, you don't need to worry about the skeptic, but of course the skeptical challenge arises also for the for the supportive knowledge that I just invoked and so forth. The question then becomes, okay, but is, is, it, is it ever okay to um, help yourself to the notion of common knowledge in the first place? In a sense, what, what, what I'm saying is that if you do have uh, uh, at least some initial common knowledge, you can overcome uh, Lederman's challenge, but is it ever okay to um, use the no this notion of common knowledge um, in theory? Um, so common knowledge is, well, it's an infinitary conjunction and it's not something we can discover out in the wild. Um, is it still okay to use it? Um, uh, or to help ourselves to it? Um, is it still okay to assume, at least initially, that some people have common knowledge of something? Um, if we do that, then we can resist uh, Lederman's skeptical challenge in the way I showed. Well, okay, so common knowledge usually, or at least one prominent job that it has in, in, appli in theoretical applications is to explain coordination. Um, one prominent example is Tolnacker's theory of the common ground. Uh, as we probably know, the set of presuppositions taken for granted for the purposes of conversation. Um, in, on, in this application, common knowledge is used um, for coordinating interpretation on anaphora, counterfactual quantification, the definite article, and so forth. Um, and furthermore, Stolnacker identifies the common ground with common belief. So it's just something slightly weaker than common knowledge. But um, if you um, if you look at the arguments uh, carefully, uh, truth doesn't really uh, play uh, a role. So the Lederman's challenge arises for common belief as well. Um, now, the question, as I said, becomes, is it ever okay to uh, talk about common knowledge uh, for a group of perhaps somewhat idealized agent? And here Lederman, so well, I mean, a, a, a big problem at this point is that you want to be able to talk about common, or at least common belief for explaining things like mutual understanding of language. And here Lederman makes an important concession. He says that we can coordinate on the resolution of context sensitive expressions by coordinating on what participants mutually know N for low N, um, where some agents mutually know to the power of two, that P, just in case they know that P and they know that they know that P. So two repetitions of the knowledge operators. Um, so, yeah. Now, this is where I want to say that uh, the level, of, the, the, the value of common knowledge lies in its generality, not in the, um, its empirical realization in groups of people. Um, so, in practice, if you take a random group of agents, um, we might not go beyond mutual knowledge n for some low n. People don't are unlikely to reason, uh, well, certainly not to the infinite iterations of the knowledge operator, but also for more than very few iterations of, um, um, of knowledge about what other people in the group know and so on. Um, 
however, it's unlikely that there be a natural boundary here, right? Agents, you know, this is sort of empirical, so perhaps I shouldn't say these things um, without tests, but if uh, you can cognize or understand mutual knowledge N, you can understand mutual knowledge N plus one, uh, at least with enough time and patience. If, um, yeah. Um, but more generally or more abstractly, uh, at the level of computation, curt curtailing the theory at level three falls short of a generalization. Here, an analogy that it's important, I think, is the theory of syntax. So at the level of practical implementation, we are not going to find agents that use um, infinite, infinitely many uh, uh, iterations of it is not the case that in front of sentences. But that's not a good, you know, and it is extremely unlikely that people in actual practice go beyond maybe one or two instances of that of that operator, right? Stacking that operator in front of a sentence. But that's not a good reason for rejecting um, uh, a theory of syntax that predicts that a sentence with um, um, infinitely many iterations of it is not the case that in front of sentence S is still a well-formed sentence, so long as, of course, S is well-formed. So for theorizing, the importance of common knowledge is not in its practical realization, but it, in the robustness of the explanations involved. OK, I just have a couple of final thoughts. Um, the importance of com common knowledge in all its generality is to uh, explain coordination. The thing is that there are at least two um, grounds for coordination that perhaps it's important to distinguish at this point. The first is what David Lewis, and, and there's also two examples that uh, are, are fairly well known in philosophy about this. The, the first occurs in, uh, in conventions and it's, it's by David Lewis. So it's the, it's the following case, a sentry knows if the enemy is coming by sea or coming by land and needs to warn this character, Paul Revere. This comes from the American independence wars. Um, Okay, so the, the enemy is coming by sea or by land, and then there's the sentry. The, sent, the sentry can hang one or two lanterns on the belfry and thereby signal to Paul Revere uh, the enemy's whereabouts. One lantern if the enemy is coming by sea, two lanterns if, the, if it's coming by land. And thus the sentry and Paul Revere coordinate their beliefs through signaling by making information public. This is essentially coordination supported by communication. But then there's another kind of ground for coordination. And it's the one briefly discussed by Hume in the inquiry. Um, imagine two people rowing in a boat. They must coordinate their movements in order to go anywhere. Now, they don't have to talk. They don't have to hang lantern, but certainly they also don't have to say anything. It's just enough that they eventually synchronize perhaps by trial and error. Um, so there is these two types of coordination, perhaps I should say two grounds for coordination. Signaling, which means communication, um, and synchronization. The first one is the one that we exploited with the Muddy Children's story to circumvent the skeptical challenge. But both types of coordination are relevant for for example, for Stolnecker's theory, but also for a lot of other applications of the notion of coordination. Now, coordination by signaling, as I said, can overcome that on a challenge. On the other hand, coordination by synchronization doesn't even need to overcome the challenge because there is no, in that case, um, there is no representing what another person knows. It is just a matter of um, keeping the tempo and matching a movement for a movement. There is no thinking about what the other knows. Um, you can also coordinate with material objects in that sense, with a pendulum or something. If, so where the, you don't have to think about what the other does. Uh, so, uh, and this is the conclusion. So recall that I started with two pictures. There was this infinite hollow mirrors where you know, when two people meet, there is this explosion of beliefs about what the other believes that the other believes and so forth and we were and Lederman um, uh, wants us to think this is implausible uh, and then there is the, there was this black box view that if it's not Lederman's as, as we mentioned but 
Um, it's the other extreme on the spectrum. And then there's what I think, I think that the, what's interesting about this, this, uh, this discussion is that um, reality is probably sort of in, in caught in the middle. Um, consider what happens when we walk on a, on a busy sidewalk, right? We are coordinating to some extent by not bumping into each other all the time. Um, sometimes we don't, we don't do, we do that without even looking at the other person. We just avoid other people just like we would avoid cars or, or trees in a forest. So there's no mind reading there. This is the synchronization uh, uh, ground for coordination. Other times we do look at other people, we meet their gaze. And in those cases, coordination may actually fail because we make the wrong guess about what the other person knows or believes and therefore is about to do, right? But in that case, any hitches in, um, in the walk can be overcome by, 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 by signaling, by declaring I'm going this way or that way. So at the end of the discussion, uh, this is the conclusion that I wanted to argue for. The common knowledge can be established by communication deduction, at least given some initial common knowledge. Uh, can, can we uh, accept this initial uh, common knowledge? Well, perhaps it's not an empirical concept, but in general, it's desirable for its generality. Here, the important point was the analogy with syntax. And then uh, there's a final distinction in two grounds for coordination. Uh, coordination by signaling requires common knowledge, but uh, coordination by synchronization does not. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dordo, uh, for this uh, very detailed and uh, nice presentation. So thank you.